Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we're glad to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate your presence. We have a number of visitors. We're delighted to have you here in the service. May God bless everyone. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the next hour we can be a real inspiration to many of you. And if you in the radio listening audience would get on your phone, call a friend, have them to tune in, then we can be a blessing to them likewise. We appreciate that very much. And we appreciate you listening today, and may God bless you. And so now at this time, we'll turn the song service over to Paul, and what he has in store for us, I'm sure, will be a blessing to our hearts. So Paul, at this time. Get your hymnal, turn to page 143. you take your Bible and turn, will you please, to two places in the Word of God. I want to read a verse of Scripture taken from Psalms chapter 121, and then read some Scripture taken from Philippians chapter 3. Turn that, will you please, in your Bible. I hope that you've had a wonderful Christmas thus far. Reminded of the little boy, I believe I told our people about it either Wednesday night or last Sunday night, about the little boy doing the Christmas holidays when the stores were filled with people. A little fellow started crying to the top of his voice and squealing and crying for his mother. I want my mama. And some of the people felt sorry for him and they came and gave him nickels and quarters and dimes and he is still screaming, I want my mama. They kept filling up, filling up his little pockets with quarters, nickels and dimes and he kept screaming, I want my mama. And finally the floor walker came up and said, uh, listen son of boy, I said, I know where your mom is. He said, be quiet. Said, I know where she is. Just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> All right, Psalms 121 and verse 8. The Lord shall preserve thy going in, thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth even forevermore. That's a great verse of scripture, very fitting for this time of the year said, The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth even forevermore. We're going out of the old year and coming into the new. I want you to turn, would you please, to the book Philippians chapter 3. It's page 1259 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. 
If you care to turn there and follow me in the scriptures, I'd appreciate it. Philippians chapter 3 beginning with verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but refuse that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made uh, conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, even already perfect. But I fall after if that I may apprehend for, for that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to bring this message today to encourage you that you might be more usable for God in the coming year than you've been this year. In just a matter of a few days, 1981 will be history. And you'll get off of Highway 81 and get on Highway number 82. And if God spares your life for 12 months, for 365 days, you'll be traveling down Highway number 82. Now it's left up to you as to what you're going to accomplish as you travel that highway 82 in the coming year. As you look back over highway 81 and your fires coming to the end of this highway, maybe you wonder, well, what have I done for God? Remember, God keeps the record. And the only thing that's going to really count when you come to the end of life's journey is what you've done for God. What have you done for God in 1981? You may say now, Preacher Edwards, I haven't done very much. Well, if you haven't, that ought to spur you on and encourage you to try to do more in 1982. We do know for a fact that would be one year closer to the time when you go into park this life, whether it be by the rapture or by the way of the grave. We know that. You know as well as I, there were people last year at this time that were alive that's gone on into eternity today. Some of them your own loved ones, your own friends. If God spares us to see another year roll around, beloved, there's some people that's listening right now to my voice that won't be here one year from now. We don't know who they are, whether it be this preacher or whether it be you or who it'll be. But without a doubt, with the number of people we have here in the auditorium, and we do have a good crowd, good attendance, and I appreciate that. And with the vast radio listening audience, the number we have out there, there's a number of people listening to me right now that'll be in eternity one year from now if Jesus tarries his coming. Now you mark my word. And if God spares you another year, you can look back and, and you can recognize some people that's gone on and you can say, Preach Edwards told us there'll be some people in eternity that were alive then that will not be alive one year from now. But the primary reason I'm bringing this message today is to encourage you to try to do more for God in this coming year than you did this year or this past year. And you can. You're moving toward the end of time as far as you're concerned, as far as earth is concerned. We're all growing older year by year, and we're growing older equally. That is, as one grows a day older, so does the other. As one grows a year older, so does the other. We know that. And we're not getting any younger, any of us. We're not getting any younger. We know that. That's a very much an understatement, to be sure. Now I want to put out some things to you that you need to do. In this year, as you travel highway number 82, that'll help you to be glad you did do when you come to the end of life's journey. 
Number one, you need to forget those things that hindered you in year 1981. As you look back over this year, no doubt you can recall some things that stood in your way, some things that hindered you, some things that stalled you on this highway, some things that sidetracked you on this highway, that you want to move out of the way as you get on highway number 82, that you might move along smoothly down this highway to the glory of God. In Philippians chapter 3, I read as my text where Paul said, Forgetting those things which are behind, it can keep your mind on that. You won't be much for God in the year that lie ahead. So don't you be worrying about things that happened this year or last year or a few years back because that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. If he can keep your mind on things of the past, you won't be much good for God in the future. And he knows that. That's why Paul said, I forget about those things. Paul had made some blunders. He'd made some mistakes like everybody does. And Paul said, I'm going to forget about those things back there. I can do nothing about that. They're in the past. I'm going to move forward and try to accomplish more in the future. And many of us can use the mistakes of yesteryear as stepping stones to help us to do better in this coming year. And if you'll do that, you can accomplish much to the glory of God. And so don't let the devil keep you worrying about some things that happened in 1981. But to get your mind set on 1982 and say, God, I want to be a better Christian. I want to accomplish more to the glory of God and not worry about the past. You know, if the devil can make you worry about yesterday... I'll get you worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. Then you're no good for today. And God wants you to live day by day to the glory of God. And do what you can for God today. There's nothing you can do about yesterday. That's gone. That's history. And you're going to have to wait until tomorrow to be able to do anything then. And so the only thing you can do is do something today. And that's what God wants you to do is do something for him day by day. And let each day take care of itself. A lot of people get stuck on yesterday. They get stuck on tomorrow. And they robbed of today. And that's what the devil wants. They tell me over in Italy. That just before midnight on New Year's Eve. Everything becomes as quiet as a mouse. You can hear a pin drop just a few minutes. Before the midnight hour strikes. And then when the midnight hour strikes, you never heard such noise, such crashing, or such yelling, and such carrying on, and such jubilee in your life. They say what happens is the people that has a lot of old furniture and things in their home, they don't tell for the next year. They have them waiting at the window or the door. And when the hour strikes, all of those things they don't want to keep for the next year go out into the street. And they begin to jump for glee in such a noise you never heard the like. They clean house as far as the past year is concerned. And they start all over for a new year. They get ready for new things and a new day and a new year. And you need to let last year or this year and things that pass be dumped out in the street as it were. And move for joy for things in the future. Now. I want to mention several things that you need to do, and I've mentioned these before, but you can't mention them too often because they're so needed. Number one, you need to make much of the Word of God. This Bible, this is God's book and God's message to you and your food, and God wants you to make much of His book. Very few people ever read their Bibles but maybe just a few verses or maybe never crack that Bible until Sunday. They might follow the preacher as he reads the text. The Word of God ought to be the book in your home and read that book every day. There should not be a book in your home any more valuable and any more precious than the Word of God. It's a lamp under your feet and a light under your pathway. God said to Joshua in chapter 1 and verse 8, he said, when Joshua led God's people to the promised land, he said, the book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to according to all that is written therein, for then, 
Notice this. When you meditate in the word of God day and night, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. God said if you'll abide according to this book, you can make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. In Psalms chapter 119 verse 11, the psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. In Psalms chapter 119 and verse 105, he said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Brother James said in James chapter 1 and verse 22, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Make much of the word of God in the coming year. You can read your Bible through if you start reading three chapters in the Old Testament, one chapter in the New every day. You can read your Bible through in a year's time. Three chapters in the Old and one in the New will carry you through the Word of God in the coming year. There's many of you that's never really read your Bible through. You ought to do that. You ought to read your Bible through Genesis right through the book of Revelation. I thank God I've had the privilege of reading the Bible through many times. That don't mean that I know all there is to know about the Word of God. I don't. I read my Bible through on my knees, backwards and forwards. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just telling you that I've read the Bible through. I thank God I've had the privilege... I got out on my knees and started the book of Genesis and read it through on my knees. Not at one time, of course. Day after day on my knees, I read the Bible through. When I got through the book of Revelation, I started the book of Revelation, the last chapter, the last verse, and read it through backwards on my knees, verse after verse. Dear people, we need to read the Bible through time and time again. And there's still a lot of things maybe you won't know that you should know. Make much of the word of God. Because when you read this blessed book. Then God is speaking to you. If you don't have a good King James version of the Bible. You ought to get you one. I prefer the original Schofield reference Bible. I still have five in my study. Available if someone wants to purchase them. The original Schofield reference Bible. I prefer that I've used that. Since God saved me. It's one of the best study Bibles you'll find today. That's the original Schofield reference Bible. The King James Version. I don't fool with these other translations. There's some rotten translations in the land today. Like the RSV. And like the New English Translation. Like the Good News for Modern Man. Like the Living Bible. They're all rotten translations. I don't waste my time on books like that. If I'm going to read the book, I want the Bible, the Word of God, that the modernists have not changed and wrecked. I take the King James Version. You have no better translation than the King James Version. Remember that. The infidels, the modernists today, the liberals, have presented the human race today with translations that's rotten to the core. If you have a Bible... Like that, translated by the liberals, infidels, and modernists, throw the thing in the trash basket and get you a good King James Version. God has used this Bible to save nations, to give revivals, to save multitudes, and it's never been improved upon and probably never will. I intend to use it as long as I'm alive on this earth. Make much over the word of God. There's nothing like this blessed book, the Bible. Determined by the help and grace of Almighty God, you're going to spend more time in this book in the coming year than you ever have. If you read this Bible, read it over and over again, memorize passages of this word, and compare scripture with scripture. Get a greater knowledge of the word of God, a working knowledge of this book. You'll be so glad you did when you come to the end of life's journey. The time you waste doing other things, the time you waste watching TV programs, reading magazines and other novels and so forth. If you would take that time and put it in the Bible, you'd be a spiritual giant in the matter of a few years in the Word of God. There's not a born-again Christian, but what couldn't be a spiritual giant when it comes to knowledge of this blessed book if you're willing to put time in the Word of God. Then we come to this, uh, the third thing you need to do. Number one, you forget those things behind. Number two, 
You make much of the Word of God. Number three, be sure that you spend time in prayer. You'd be surprised at how little God's people pray today. I would hate to embarrass you and ask you how many of you have spent five minutes on your knees in the past week. You'd be greatly embarrassed. There'd be only a very few of you could stand up and say, Preacher, I spent five minutes or more on my knees this past week. You'd turn red in the face of, of embarrassment. Now just think about that. Five minutes of talking to your Father in heaven. You've ignored God for a solid week. Now if you got sick and into trouble, you'd be calling on Him. And yet you go day after day after day after day and ignore your Father in heaven and never speak to Him. What a shame. If your child wandered around you all the week and never spoke to you, how would you feel? You say, preach, I'd feel very badly. All right. How do you think God feels when you go all the week and never speak to Him? Oh, you say, preach, I hadn't thought about it in that sense. Well, you need to think about it. God is your Father. If you are saved, you have a Father in heaven. He's longing for you to talk with Him. God wants you to speak to Him. And there should be a time every day in your life when you have what is called closet prayer time. That should be a time when you get alone with God to pray and talk to God about some things that you don't want every Tom, Dick, and Harry to know about probably, just you and God, and you want to tell Him about it. You should talk to God every day on your knees somewhere. And then in addition to that, you need to go in the attitude of prayer. And then not only that, but you need to pray with God's people in unison in groups of two or three or more as you talk to God in that manner. But by all means, you ought to have your closet prayer time every day. John and Charles Wesley's mother, she gave birth to 19 children and lived in a small house. And she had no secret place to pray, but she wore a long white apron. And then at a certain time during the day, she had sat down in the chair in the middle of the floor. And she'd take that long white apron and throw it back over her head. And when she did that, those children knew to become quiet and say nothing. And if anybody came to the door to tell them that mother is praying, and they'll have to wait on the outside till she finishes. That mother gave birth to 19 children. Two great ministers came out of that group, John and Charles Wesley. But she was a woman that had her secret closet prayer time every day. She had a responsibility of rearing her children and she knew she needed God's help. And she let nothing deter her from that time of closet prayer. Every one of you ought to pray every day somewhere, someplace, on your knees before God if possible. You ought to do that. Spend time in prayer. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 7, pray without ceasing. In James chapter 4 and verse 2, the Bible said, You have not because you ask not. You don't understand that, can't you? You have not because you ask not. If you would ask, then maybe you'd have. Many of you heard me tell about this minister over in South Carolina by the name of Odell Good. I think he lives in Florida now, but he and his brothers were out playing, and they'd go in the afternoon and ask Mother for a biscuit. And she'd give them one of these big old cathead biscuits and put them some butter in that biscuit, and they'd go back out in the yard and eat it and play. Odell tarried behind, the other brothers went out in the yard playing, and he went out, he had some jelly in his biscuit. And his brother said, Odell, how in the world did you get jelly in your biscuit? We only got a biscuit and some butter. He said, I asked Montfort. He said, if you'd asked Montfort, you'd have got some jelly. He said, the reason you didn't get jelly, you didn't ask for it. Now, the reason God's people many times don't get what they need and what they could deserve to get by the blessings from God is you don't ask for it. You ought to ask God for it once in a while. Many times your children get things because they ask you for them. They won't take no for an answer. And you will say, well, I'm going to give it to them to get them to leave me alone. God said when you pray, that's what you ought to do because of the importunity many times you get the answer when you wouldn't get it otherwise. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 9, I said, you ask it shall be given. You seek and you shall find knock and it shall be open unto you. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 13, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, 
How much more should your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them to ask Him? And so you need to ask God. Then number four, you need to be faithful in church attendance. I don't know what to say to encourage you more to be faithful in church attendance. If you're not, you're the loser. You certainly are. Now listen to this scripture, will you please? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Every one of you ought to underscore this. This is God's word. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. As a man of some is but exhorting one another. And that so much the more as you see that day approaching. What God is saying here if there's ever a time. When you ought to be faithful in going to church services. It is now. Because you can see that day approaching when the Lord is soon coming back. We're living in troublesome days. We're living in perilous times. This world today is sitting on a powder keg. And if it's every time when God's people should come to the house of God to worship, it is now. You shouldn't let anything hinder you if you're physically able to be in God's house. You ought to try to be in God's house. Make it your business to do so. If you'd be as determined to be in God's house on Sunday as you ought to be in, on your job on Monday, you'd have no problem. Put God first in your life and God will be with you as you sojourn. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 15, always abounding in the work of the Lord. God spoke about faithful Abraham. Abraham was a faithful man and God blesses faithfulness and God wants you to be faithful in serving and faithful in your church attendance. Yo that to the Lord, yo that to your church, yo that to your pastor, yo that to the members of the church, yo that to lost sinners. To be faithful in attending worship service and that much some more as we move toward the end of this age. Then number five, if you want the blessing of God on you and want to see how that God can shower good things upon you in the coming year, be faithful in Christian giving. Now the Bible tells you in Malachi chapter 3 verses 7 through 12. I won't take time to read that. God said if you would tithe your income into his work. And open the windows of heaven and pull you out of blessing. That you won't be able to receive. Now God said if you don't believe I'll do that. Just try him and see. Now some of you have never tried God to see what God will do for you. I'm going to say this on the authority of the word of God. That if you would be a tither this coming year and give God one dime out of every dollar that you earn. Then of course the more you give above that the more you're going to receive. If you would give God at least a dime out of every dollar you earn during this coming year. Now you listen to me. You might not believe this. But you'll be the loser if you don't. When you come to the end of 1982 the traveling of that highway. You're going to be far better off in more ways than one if you'll tithe than you will be if you don't. Now God's a great collector. I've known people who say, well, I know better. I'll, I'll just keep all of my income. I'm doing all right. Now I've seen people as they've grown older and really as they get up and maybe get too old to take care of a job and have a good income. I've seen things happen to them when God would just turn around and collect all their back ties. And collect those things that they should have done in days gone by. And there they lose it in their old days. You don't want that to happen to you. Remember that God is a collector. He knows how to collect. He knows when. And just because you're getting along fine and making good money and putting money in the bank and buying this and that and other things. You think, well, I'm doing all right. Well, you just wait a minute. The mills of God grind slowly, but they grind. There may come a time when you grow to grow older and disabled to make the kind of money you're making now. God said, well, it's time for me to collect. And the savings that you've saved up, God may take his part of them. And really hurt in those days. Now, you go ahead and honor God, and God will take care of you in your time of need. I challenge every one of you to be a tither of your income in the coming year. Not only will God bless you materially, and you'll have more materially and spiritually and physically, but you're going to have something in heaven that thieves can't take away from you when you come to the end of life's journey. You're very wise when you learn the secret of tithing. I wish I had time to tell you about some millionaires today 
that are tithers. Started out giving a tenth and now they give 90% and keep a tenth and got more money than they know what to do with. You tithe and you'll stay in good standing with God financially. The Bible says in Luke 6, 38, Give and it shall be given unto you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, Upon the first day of the week and that Sunday, let every one of you, every Christian, everyone that has an income, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him. God expects each individual child of God, young or old, to tithe his income, teenager, junior, uh, adult, elderly, or whatnot. God said, let every one of you lay by him in store as God's prospered you that past week. If you have made $100, $10 that belongs to God. Put it away. God expects you to put it. If you made $50, $5, that's God's. Don't take it and spend it on yourself. Put it where you ought to put it and God will bless you and God will take care of your need. And then I'll move along with thought number six and I must hurry. You need to be concerned about your health. In 3 John 2, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as I so prosper. You know God is concerned about your health and many of you abuse your bodies and as you grow older, you're going to suffer from that. Did you know that? There's people right today, if they'd have laid off all that alcohol, if they laid off those cigarettes, if they laid off that dope, if there hadn't been a, a gluttonous, they'd have been in far better health today and could enjoy living for God. But now they have ruined their bodies because of things they did in days gone by and they're going to suffer and suffering probably the rest of their days. Now... That body you have is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You be careful how you abuse that body. Give up your bad habits. Lay off alcohol. Lay off the tobacco. Lay off the dope. And don't overeat and become so, so fat until it damages your health. You know I'm telling you the truth. We all have that problem. We're living in the land of, of plenty and it's so hard to push back from the table. And we're all guilty. I'm guilty. And many of you are guilty, but you are damaging your body when you become overweight. And that body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, and God will hold you responsible. God wants you to take care of that body, that he might use it a long time to his glory. But if you destroy that temple, then you'll be the loser. Some of you ought to give up your habits, your bad habits. And some of you ought to be careful about overeating and doing things to destroy your body. Some of you worry yourself in the ill health, and that's a sin. Determined, you're going to stop that worrying during this coming year. You don't have to worry yourself to death. Worrying will send you to a premature grave. Worrying will wreck your health and your mind. Turn over to God. Cast all your care upon Him because He careth for you. You don't have to worry yourself to the hospital and ill health and to the graveyard. Quit that worrying. Turn over to God. Billy Sunday said he went to, when he went to bed at night, he didn't care anymore to bed with him. He could kick off one big kick and he went to sleep. Quit worrying yourself to death. Many of you worry about things you do nothing about and you cross the river before you get to the bridge afraid the bridge not going to be there. And you worry and you worry and you worry and you damage your health and your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost and you sin against God when you do so. The Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Then finally live for others. The Bible said in Romans 14, 7, None of us lift ourselves, and no man dieth himself. 1 John 3, 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We need to live for God and live for each other. What we do is to help others. Be kind toward others. Don't be crabby. Don't carry around an old crabby spirit and, and a bad attitude. Watch your attitude. Be careful about your, your friendliness. Be, uh, be friends to people. Be kind toward people. Don't be murmuring and complaining all the time and crabby and grouchy. God wants us to exhibit a good testimony to the glory of God. These things we can check on and do something about as we sojourn for God. Be sweet in your soul. Be a kind Christian. Be a Christian other people like to be around. Don't be griping and grumbling and murmuring and complaining about something all the time. Be somebody that when somebody can come into your presence... They can be uplifted. That's the kind of Christian you ought to be. And then you're the real salt of the earth. With this poem, I close. It says, just one request. Dear Master, for this coming year, just one request I bring. I do not pray for happiness or any earthly thing. I do not ask to understand the way thou leadest me. 
But this I ask, teach me to do the things that pleaseth thee. I want to know thy guiding voice to walk with thee each day. Dear Master, make me swift to hear and ready to obey. And thus the year I now begin, a happy year will be, if I am seeking just to do the things that please thee. Stand to your feet. Father, I pray that this message today will help thy people to determine by the help and grace of Almighty God to do a greater job, to be more faithful, to love thee more in the year that lies ahead. God, we don't know. 1982 may be the number on our grave marker. We don't know, Father. And help us to be faithful in serving thee and speak to this audience in Jesus' name. Amen. They're playing a stanza so. Now listen while they play. If you're here unsaved, backslidden on God, or you want to join the church, or you want to come forward for any reason, you may come while they play. I'll be right here to help you. How about it? Come if God is speaking, would you come? unsaved, backslidden, want to come back to God, join the church for any reason. You may come. Just a moment. We're going. 